So, you know, we've developed an, an invertible, um, a perfectly invertible, mathematically perfectly invertible discrete Fourier transform. Now we know we can we can we can come we can pop in and out of the of the Fourier domain uh, as many times as we like. You know, uh, if we use double precision numbers, we'll we'll never see the effect of our of our uh, of the imprecision in the in the computer. Um, I, I like to use uh, single precision. Uh, um, a lot of my um, a lot of my codes are written around single precision data to save time and space, um, computer time and space. Um, and and after uh, after ten or so transforms, you'll start to see uh, the errors creeping up into the the third or fourth decimal place. You know, so it's not. Uh, it's as accurate as you can make your computers, your computer codes to do it, and and your data, uh, your data formats to represent. Uh, but mathematically, it's perfect. Okay, um, but it takes n squared operations. So for one of those, um, let's see, if we had one of our seismograms, uh, and let's say it was a month long, right? Um, and a uh, like an autocorrelation or getting a spectrum is going to take uh, you know it takes n squared uh, operations for the uh, for the autocorrelation it takes n squared operations for the uh, autocorrelation um, so we have three six hundred seconds per hour and uh, um, what uh, in a month we have on the order of six thousand. Or is it sixty thousand minutes, or sixty thousand hours? Six thousand hours. Um, Thirty times twenty-four. Six thousand. Yeah, six thousand hours. Um, so uh, uh, you know we're um, okay. So we got uh, you know ten to the fourth. Hours times ten to the um, the third. Uh, let's say uh, we got two times ten to the seventh seconds, and at one hundred samples per second on our seismic network, we've got uh, um, two billion. Um, uh, you know, a couple billion uh, samples in a month-long seismogram, and and that may be what it. I, I think I think in. Uh, Ilana's paper on um, on uh, getting empirical Green's functions from our network. Uh, she needs about a month long record for the for the worst stations. So so um, that means uh, 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 okay. That means we got four times ten to the eighteenth um, n squared is four times ten to the eighteenth operations. Okay. And and if we can do uh, what are we up to 10, uh, 10 mega flops on a uh, you know on 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 this machine maybe not I mean ten giga flops on this machine so um, we're still talking um, uh, we're still talking a hundred million seconds then to do that um, and there's uh, what. Uh, there's about ten. There's about thirty million seconds in a year. So, so you know, getting the spectra using the DFT to get the spectrum of our of our month long seismogram is not looking very practical, is it? I mean, hopefully I've slipped a digit here, but this this sounds really ridiculous. Um, and you know, I mean, I could conceive of it now, and, and we could, um, you know, at least we can we can throw a. You know, if we have uh, uh, two hundred um, cores around, you know, CPU cores, we could we could throw a hundred seismograms and have them all calculated at once. But we're going to be waiting. Uh, we might be waiting ten years. Okay, um, doesn't sound very practical. So so, um, what I'm covering next is some very very clever ways that that uh, people. Came up with back in the '60s, early '60s, um, before um, um, 
you know, before you had more than 2K of, of memory in, in some of the biggest computers, okay, they figured out how to Fourier transform, you know, thousand element seismographs. And this was done uh, in two places. Uh, um, and the ones who published it, Cooley and Tucky, they, uh, they worked for Shell or Chevron, I think. Um, maybe Chevron and Arco. So it was used, you know, this, this so-called fast Fourier transform was used in uh, uh, first. It was used first uh, in the oil industry for seismic exploration. Okay. Um, and they, you know, they, they figured out a way to do a, uh, um, you know, an ostensibly million operation DFT on a thousand, uh, uh, thousand element seismogram uh, in a few seconds on a, on a 1962 computer. Okay. Which is a, a remarkable achievement. I, I really think they should have gotten a Nobel Prize in mathematics for this. They've enabled more, more work by more people, uh, you know, than than almost anything else I could think of. Um, maybe they didn't save lives, you know, like like the medicine Nobel Prize winners, but they sure saved a bunch of economies. They made seismic exploration possible. Um, okay, so. Uh, uh, Let's consider uh, let's consider our, our our good old four element time series. Um, X uh, uh, sub n is uh, has four elements in time: x zero, x one, x two, x three. Here's the Fourier transform uh, at at uh, some omega. We just we just get that by uh, um, by uh, 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 by multiplying it by the uh, uh, you know, taking a z transform, right? So the z tra transform is x zero plus x one times z plus x two times z squared plus x three times z to the third power, and then we take uh, z at uh, to be equal to uh, 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 e to the i uh, uh, e to the i omega. So we have the Fourier uh, definition of z, and then we evaluate that. At uh, that x at omega at at frequency index j equals one. Okay, so this this involves nine multiplication operations. Okay, now suppose we rearrange right. So we take x zero plus x one z plus x two z squared plus x three z to the third, and we rearrange the uh, the the order of the computation. You know. Uh, uh, it's not a not a bad way, so we begin on the inside here with uh, z times x three, then we add x two, and then we multiply that product that sum by z, and then we add x one, and we multiply that product by z. Right, this is a um, a left associative uh, multiplication here, and then we add x zero. All right, that's only got three multiplications. We're we're assuming here that in the computer, and this is still true. Um, it's more work to uh, to multiply numbers than uh, than add them. You can add them in one clock cycle and and without special uh, hardware, which is built into Pentium chips now. Um, you know, it, it takes more than one clock cycle to uh, uh, to to, mul to multiply numbers. Okay, or and and way more than than one clock cycle to divide them. Okay. So uh, uh, all right, you know here's uh, here's a Fourier transform which looked like it would take nine uh, clock cycles. And now it only takes three. It's a pretty good savings of time. All right. Um, here's a here's a convolution. Okay. Let's say we want to do some filtering. We want to take this month long time series. You know, it's uh, x is. Uh, has uh, 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 a million, uh, you know, two billion uh, time points, and uh, we want to filter it. And so, you know, uh, we uh, it doesn't matter so much uh, how long the uh, uh, the filter time series is, you know, that we're convolving it by. This this uh, star here is a convolution. To get the output y, 
we've got to deal with this giant x time series. Now, OK, so there uh, you can see that, that there's basically you know, a, mil a billion squared multiplications that we're going to have to do. All right, if we had, uh, on the other hand, let's say that somehow we magically had um, the Fourier transform of the filter and the Fourier transform of x, that we magically you know, pulled out of a hat the Fourier transform of the input. Okay? We could find the Fourier transform of the output y by this simple multiplication, which if we have n frequency samples, you know, it's just multiplying f at you know, 10 hertz by x at 10 hertz. Okay? And that's only n operations. That's a lot cheaper than n squared multiplications. So if we, if we could, this kind of opens the window here, if we could somehow drastically reduce the number of multiplications for the Fourier transform, then there's going to be a lot of operations like uh, convolution that will be cheaper in the Fourier domain. And here, you know, I, I, I miswrote it uh, uh, as continuous omega. Here, this is really x sub j. This is a discrete Fourier transform. Okay? And, and just to get it at 1j takes n operations you know, that get, all get summed together. The results all get summed. Uh, x, uh, x, uh, sub n, x at n times e to the i 2 pi over big N times j times n. Okay? So that's the uh, discrete Fourier transform as we know now. You know, absolutely perfect, uh, perfectly invertible. But it takes n squared operations. So it's a bit too long for, um, for uh, convolving or autocorrelating um, or autocorrelating uh, a month long time series. Okay, n squared is a bit too much. Okay. Oh, here, yeah. Um, so uh, uh, the fast Fourier transform was published in 1965, and um, you know, 18 years later, I went and looked it up uh, in the in the journal, uh, and they have a Fortran. You know, Cooley and Tucky published a Fortran program, Fortran 66 program, which uh, uh, which which accomplishes the uh, fast Fourier transform. Um, the uh, 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 there's this uh, fellow named Herbert at Chevron who, who uh, probably did the work first but didn't publish it. it I'm surely it was a competitive uh, uh, advantage to Chevron for quite a while. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, you know this is this is old technology now, but um, you know what? Uh, in your phone, in your camera. Um, uh, these Fourier transforms are, are uh, you know, say to make a JPEG file, they're not done. They're not done using a DFT. They're done using the Cooley Tucky FFT. So it's had incredible. Um, th this is one of the most long, useful, and long-lasting algorithms that I've ever heard of. Uh, it's really brilliant. Um, the secret to the FFT is a concept called doubling, or it's an operation called doubling. So basically, um, you can determine a transform of length 2n from two transforms of length n, okay, using a very simple operation. All right. So I'll, I'll introduce doubling here, and then, and then tomorrow we'll, we'll come back and, and, and be able to, uh, to finish it off. Um, so the objective is to compute f at uh, uh, frequency j, okay, uh, and and notice here that uh, that we have two transforms of length n, okay. So we're going to sum over uh, all um, uh, all time points from n equals zero to two n minus one, okay. So our, our the length of our time series is two n. All right, and um, uh, and so here's the the Fourier trans the DFT for that uh, f sub n uh, f at n uh, times e to the i two pi over two n times n times j, okay, and um, we can simplify this a little bit. 
you know, we're still summing from n equals 0 to 2n minus 1. And here is f at n. And then the ex exponential, we, we call it v. It's, it's the doubling exponential now. Right? We've got w, we've got v. Uh, there's a lot of these exponentials running around. Um, hard to keep them straight. Uh, so it's v to the power of j times n. Okay, and we simply define v as e to the i pi over n, right? And we, we, we just looked at omega 0 equal to e to the i 2 pi over n, right? So hard to keep these straight. Um, but this is uh, in this section that this is going to be true. v is e to the i pi over n, and so then you can see this reduces to uh, uh, v to uh, j, uh, v to the power of j times n. Um, okay, so uh, we have uh, a 2n long um, uh, filter. I'm sorry, wait. Yeah, 2n long uh, input, f, little f. Okay. And, uh, but what if we interleaved, you know, f0 was equal to x0, f1 was, was a second time series, y0, f2 was x1, the next one in x, and f3 was, was y1. So basically, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to mesh together uh, two, um, two, two n-length time series into this 2n-length f time series. So the, uh, the even components, f to the 2i, are x sub i, and the odd components, f to the 2i plus 1, or I mean, sorry, f at 2i plus 1, are y at i. Okay, So uh, x is the even index, y is the odd index. Okay, So we put this all in, and x and y are going to have these following transforms. Okay, So here's the x is the even index, right? And there's uh, you know, just recognizing v in there. We're looking, you know, we're summing from n equals 0 to n minus 1 x at n times v to the 2 times n times j. And then for y, it's, uh, uh, it's y at n times v to the 2 times n times j. Right? And so then the whole thing, you know, we got to add. This is the brilliant thing about the, the linear nature of the Fourier transform. It doesn't matter how we divide out the data. You can see here, even where we, we take every other time step, every other time sample, and we split them into two series, we can still add them back together in determining f at j. Okay? So it's a, it's a n-length transform uh, at uh, the even indices and an n-length transform at the odd indices. Okay? So this is, uh, this is the, doubling, uh, the doubling formula. Notice, notice this extra this this two n plus one that come you know we can bring that out out of the summation as an extra v, you know basically factor it out of the out of the summation. Okay, so it's really uh, uh, you know this Fourier transform plus v to the power of j times this Fourier transform. All right, so uh, uh, we'll go through these doubling formulas and. Uh, uh, and develop the a scheme for the whole Fourier transform. You know, building up um, using the doubling formula, and then after we after we figure all that out, you'll see why it actually reduces the amount of computation time. Okay, we've been discussing how to compute the fast Fourier transform, which is essentially going to be nothing more than a uh, reordering of the of the computation. Right now, uh, computing a Fourier transform just like uh, with computing a cross correlation or autocorrelation takes uh, n squared operations, n squared multiplications, which is um, uh, where, where n is uh, capital N is the uh, number of time samples. And we're deep in the algebra at the moment of. An exploration to see if we can cut that down. Okay, for a doing a Fourier transform of a month-long seismogram, 
even with today's computers, we're still in trouble. Okay, we can't do it very efficiently. So I would like to uh, see if there's any way of doing this. Uh, and and I told you that this was worked out um, more than 50 years ago by uh, Cooley and Tucky, and it revolutionized oil exploration. It revolutionized communication, revolutionized surveying with GPS, revolutionized photography with uh, JPEG, uh, huge effects of this fast Fourier transform. Uh, but we're going to derive it here, to, just to make sure that you understand the ins and outs of it. Um, why, do I, why do I take you through a 50-year-old development? Because I still see a lot of things that we have problems with, and a lot of a lot of things that need improvement. Uh, and I know there are brilliant insights and brilliant shortcuts out there. And I want to give you the tools such that you have a chance of finding them for your own thesis, hopefully, uh, or or maybe for a profitable business uh, down the line. I'd, I'd very much like to promote that. So that's what that's what 706 and 757 are all about. Uh, they're making sure that you understand some of our most useful uh, old tools, so that uh, uh, to inspire you and and to enable you to discover uh, some new tools, which we sorely need. So here are um, here's a time series. And uh, you know it goes from uh, uh, starts at uh, element zero, element one, element two, element three. Uh, but we've just said, well, the length of this series instead of being n, it's two n. And so the last element out here on the right side is at index two n minus one. And then we break up this time series. And uh, why do we? Why do we break it up? Because we already know that the Fourier transform is a perfectly linear process. We can split up the Fourier. We can split up a time series in any way we like. Uh, according, you know, we can take the samples that have high amplitude and separate them from the samples that have low amplitude. We can take in the in the in the omega in the spectral domain in the frequency domain. We can take the samples that are at low frequency and split them apart from the samples that have high frequency. Uh, and here we're splitting up into the even samples and the odd samples. Okay, and so the even samples are x, and the odd samples are y, and each one has its own uh, index. There you can see in that uh, that little little bunch of memory mailboxes uh, uh, on the bottom. And, you know, here you, I, I think what what I'm trying to do here is visualize. The arrays in the computer memory, uh, so that I can figure out what to do with them. So I draw these 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 rows of mailboxes. Okay, and each one contains a number, um, and in fact, each one contains a complex number. Um, even though we know that our the seismograms we're going to be starting with most most all of the data that we start with is certainly all real, the imaginary part zero. But we we allow these boxes to contain complex numbers. Okay, so. Um, uh, here is the, uh, the Fourier transform defined for that series of length 2n, the series f. Okay? That's the 2n length series. And, and you can see all we had to do was, uh, was just you know, manipulate um, the exponential to account for that 2n instead of n, all right? capital N. Uh, and then we, uh, we take out. Um, and you see it, uh, the the twos cross out, uh, cross out, cross out, and we have this. Uh, the Fourier transform becomes this f at uh, time index little n times this new v number, just a complex number, um, to the power of j times n, and v we define to be the complex number, which is the this Euler exponential uh, e to the i pi over big n. Okay, so and and we have to sum, of course, from zero at little n equals zero to two big n minus one. 
so it's just you know a rewriting of the definition of the Fourier transform. Okay. Uh, and then here we write down the uh, the transform of x and the transform of y in 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 their individual terms. But then we see, okay, where does v come in here? All right, and then we we give, uh, you know, up here x is given uh, index j and y is given index j. Um, I'm sorry, they're both uh, 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 little x in the time domain is given index n and y is also given index little n. Uh, and now we we add them together and recognize that x is the even part. Uh, which is uh, f at uh, two times n, okay, and uh, uh, y is the odd part, which is x at two times n plus one, okay. So it's an, it's a, got an odd index of in within f, okay. So we've expressed the individual Fourier transforms of of x and y in terms of v, and you can see we have v to the two n times j. And uh, now we've we've written it uh, in terms of that original two n length series f. So this big f here is the Fourier transform of the um, um, of the of the two length, two n length series, and it's got index j. And you can see it's the in, it's it's the combination, the sum of the of the uh, Fourier transforms of the one n length series, the even indices and the odd indices of f. Okay, and and uh, then we pull out the extra, you know, there's an extra v in here. You know, we have uh, still two n times j, but then we add a v, so the v uh, times j, the v to the power j comes out uh, in the second term of the sum here. All right. So what do we what do we need to do, okay, to make this combination? Um, for um, for frequencies that are frequency indices j that are less than big N, okay. So the for the first half of the Fourier transform, okay, uh, then we have uh, f at frequency index j is equal to this is this is now the uh, uh, the Fourier transform, capital X at frequency j plus <clears throat> v times uh, v to the power of j times uh, the Fourier transform of y at the at the uh, <clears throat> at index j. Now, now this is just you know kind of simple substitution, but but this is really right here. That's the brilliant insight. Okay, so the first half. Of the Fourier tran, you know, if we're if we're somehow handed the Fourier transform of the n-length series, then in in exactly n uh, steps, okay, you know, going going from uh, um, you know for each of the uh, frequencies from uh, uh, j to uh, to n, right, uh, and and we've got uh, uh, capital N, um, we've got capital N multiplications here, v to the power of j times uh, y at frequency j. Okay, and so we have one multiplication and one addition per frequency, per frequency uh, uh, index. You know, so we got n. You know, this this is a really this is not n squared operations here. This is just n operations, which you know, for a month long seismogram, that's years sooner than um, than uh, uh, n squared operations. Okay, so uh, what we've done here is is we've calculated well the first half of a two n length transform given the given two n length transforms, and and all it takes is n capital N multiplications. So it's not very much work at all. Nothing like n squared. Okay, so that's the that's a brilliant insight that uh, the people who developed the fast Fourier transform had. So then, uh, uh, okay, well we still got the other half, right? So for n capital n less than j, 
less than 2n, right? We go from uh, n to um, 2n minus 1. Then we let uh, uh, the index j be equal to n plus k. And we got to change the, uh, the exponents a little bit. Uh, but that's just, that's just algebra, right? So, so uh, for f at j you know, up to n, we got this equation up here. And then for the second half, for n, you know, um, for j greater than um, capital N, you know, we got f at n plus k, right? So k is now the uh, the index, right? The frequency index in the second half at the higher frequencies, if you like. And and we go from n equals zero to n minus one. Okay. So here, you know, really just writing down the definitions of the Fourier transforms. Uh, in in terms of uh, of this v uh, substitution that we've made, so we have f at two n the even part times v to the power of two n times the quantity n plus k, and then we have um, uh, we have to add uh, the uh, the odd part. So we're summing again, you know, over n um, uh, uh, f at uh, the odd ones two n plus one. And then it's times uh, uh, v to the power of the quantity two n plus two little n plus one, yes, times the quantity n plus k. Uh, and so we can, uh, you know, factor out some v's here. Uh, so the second term we factor out v to the power of k, v to the power of n. Uh, and then so here you see we can just identify in here the Fourier transform of um, we just identify the Fourier transform of um, uh, of the n-length series, which is the even ones, and here the the Fourier transform of the uh, n-length series, which is the odd ones, and we do have uh, these extra factors here: uh, v to the k, v to the n. Um, let's see. There are some, you know, there's some simpler things here, right? This. Uh, uh, v to the power of two times n, little n times big n, um, is uh, uh, you know we write out what the definition of v, which is e to the i pi over n, and then times two times n times big n. Uh, we cross out the big n's and um, and we have two pi to the nth power, right? And and uh, uh, so uh, that's a uh, you know that's the cosine of two pi times n, which is a you know n is an integer uh, here. Um, so it's zero, one, or minus one, right? And the uh, but whatever factor of two pi we get, you know we always come back around the unit circle to to one, you know, on the real axis. So the uh, uh, you know we have uh, the cosine of, of some numbers of some number of two pi's uh, plus i sine the uh, the i times the sine of the uh, some number of two pi's the sine of at two pi is zero uh, so it's just a real number and it's just one okay uh, v to the capital n which we factored out here is e to the i pi over n times n. Big n, okay. So the n big n's cross out. We have e to the i pi, so we have uh, cosine pi minus i sine pi, and uh, again the sine part is zero, so it's a real number, and that's just minus one, okay. So uh, you substitute in those uh, uh, simple factors, and and this uh, you know kind of nasty looking line up here, then uh, simplifies. So the uh, uh, the second part of the uh, 2n length transform, f at frequency n plus k, is the Fourier transform of the even uh, samples, uh, which is uh, big X at k minus okay, v to the power of k um, times y at frequency index k. So then, just summarizing, you know, we have we call these the doubling formulas. Okay, so you're given, you're handed the uh, Fourier transforms of the uh, of the n length, you know, even, and the n length odd, right? The Fourier transform of the even sample 
uh, even samples is uh, x of j, uh, is x, and big X in the Fourier transform of the odd samples is y. Okay, and here, you know, to compute the um, um, uh, basically, there's just two n multiplications and additions to get uh, uh, to solve both doubly formulas. The first one, f uh, for f at j, gets you the uh, uh, the Fourier transform of um, of the uh, the first of the first half, the first half of the Fourier transform. Uh, f at n plus j gets you the uh, the second half of the Fourier transform, the higher frequency half at the higher uh, uh, fre frequency indices. Um, and and notice that that j, you know, is still just n, just in, in, increases up to n, actually n minus one for the indices. Here's the definition of v that we're using. Okay, so. Uh, uh, in n steps, you know, if we're handed the Fourier transforms of, if we are handed the Fourier transforms of uh, um, of n-length series in in n operations only, we can then compute um, in two n operations only. We can then compute the full Fourier transform of the two n length. Uh, the full two n length Fourier transform. Okay, uh, and uh, don't forget, um, you know, we start with a. We're, the idea here is we're starting with a seismogram that is two n length, and we're going to end up with a Fourier transform that is two n length. Okay, so we're we're not confusing the issue that way by making them any different in length. So so. Uh, Okay, I mean that's all. That's all we've got is is one step in a buildup of, of Fourier transforms. Okay, and 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 this this process goes by induction. Okay, so we start uh, uh, just to kind of I don't know maybe I'm I'm giving you a spoiler here. We start with we got to start somewhere, and we have the we have the Fourier transforms you know for very short series, and then we double the length. And we double the length, and we double the length, okay, and, and until we get to uh, you know to the length we need, you know our month-long time series, okay. So uh, uh, this this and, and how are we going to build up that that inductive uh, uh, process? Okay, we're going to build it up with this uh, uh, this butterfly symbology, and, and actually. Um, uh, there are a lot of chips, and there's probably one in your in your phone, uh, in your in your camera phone right now, uh, and and they actually have circuitry, you know, to to build up these uh, uh, to do these butterflies. Okay, so so here's the uh, the Fourier transform, uh, the n-length Fourier transform uh, of the even samples. Here's the n-length Fourier transform of the odd samples. <clears throat> okay. And um, and then here are the operations. The butterfly is kind of the operations. What contributes to the first half of the uh, of the four of the two n length transform, right? So here's f at k is the first half of the Fourier of the two n length Fourier transform. F at n plus k is the second half of the two n length Fourier transform. So we start on the left side. We end up on the right side. Okay. We start with two n-length transforms. We end up with one two n-length transform. Okay, so first, you know, the equation for f at k is x at k plus v to the power of k times uh, y at k. So we we bring over x at k and add it in to f at k, and uh, and then we bring over y at k. We multiply it. By one, um, by uh, v to the power of k, and then add it into f of k as well. Um, for the second half, what goes into f at n plus k? We bring over x at k, and we um, um, uh, oh, and here's v of k. Okay, so that applies to both of these, you know, tilted uh, uh, paths. Okay. 
and we bring over uh, uh, y at k, we multiply it by minus v of k, or we multiply it by v of k, and then we subtract it from, uh, uh, from f at n plus k. Okay? Uh, and and um, you could actually, I, I wish I had a I wish I had a, a micrograph, you know, uh, at least the earlier uh, butterfly circuits that were built uh, like by Cray and, and by, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the early supercomputer makers, um, they actually, uh, you could, you know, you could look at close up at the, at the surface of the chips and you would see these pathways and, you know, there would be a multiplier and there'd be an accumulator uh, and there were, you know, actually little boxes here where the where these things were, um, and and you could fit uh, you could fit uh, you know a thousand and twenty four of them um, on a uh, on a chip, and and so you would have a uh, a chip that basically in in a few clock cycles would uh, uh, would kind of parallel process. These doubling formulas all the way through, and, and in a few clock cycles, you get a Fourier transform of a 1024 length um, uh, time series. And you know, starting in the late 60s and right through the 70s and 80s, these chips uh, were used, uh, you know, billions of times every day by the uh, by the big oil companies and the big uh, service companies like uh, like Western Geophysical at the time. Um, and uh, they are also used um, by uh, um, radio astronomers and uh, um, and and electrical engineers doing signal analysis. So uh, it was a good uh, you know this this uh, this was actually this butterfly was actually made. Okay, so where do we start? Okay. Right, we're going to build up to a two n length transform, um, and and the question is, uh, where do we, you know, well, what we start with are individual, uh, you, you know, our, our our what if we start with a time series of length one? Okay, what's the Fourier transform of a time series that has exactly one sample in time? Okay, uh, well, let's go up to a, uh, you know, here's a, here's a, uh, um, let's see, I'm looking for a, yeah, here's a, here's a Fourier transform definition, okay, so, so x only has sample at index, you know, little n equals zero, okay, so, uh, and n is equal to one, right, so, uh, we don't, you know, the summation only goes through one, once, and so the whole Fourier transform. Uh, again, we have one sample on the Fourier transform, okay, and um, so j is is only going to be equal to zero, okay. So we have x at zero times e to the i um, two pi over n, okay. Well, uh, n is one, so it's e to the i two pi times j, which is zero, times n, which is zero. So it's just x at, at index 0 times 1, right? Uh, so, so, you know, a one-length series is its own Fourier transform. So it's easy to start there. OK. So uh, uh, <clears throat> so here's, here's the... Uh, here's the uh, uh, you know, here's the the one length time series, which is f at zero, the even one. Here's the one length time series, which is f at one, the odd one. And we go through one butterfly, and we get a two length Fourier transform. Okay, which would be the Fourier transform of the of the two length series f zero f one. Okay, and what is the you know look at the doubling formulas. Okay, here they are, right? F zero is uh, let's see and and uh, uh, n is um, um, let's see. We have v at k, which is um, which is zero. So uh, 
we have um, you know k is zero, n is one, k is zero, uh, and here um, uh, n is one, k is zero. So we have uh, uh, this two-length Fourier transform contains f zero, big F zero, which is little f zero plus v to the zeroth power, which is one times f one. And then uh, we the second element of the Fourier transform, the two-length Fourier transform, is f at one, which is uh, f at zero minus v to the zeroth power, so minus f at one. Okay. Now, now uh, uh, I hope this makes sense. You know what what should we get for the DC component of a two-length Fourier transform? Okay. The DC component should be the average of all the all the points, and and that's what it is. I mean, we we're I, I've omitted a, a scale factor here, right? This should be f zero plus f one divided by two, but that's the DC component. And 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 then what is f one of a two length time series? That's the Nyquist component. Okay, so that's you know. That's representing a you know that's two samples on this highest possible wavelength, okay? So it's it's representing the difference between the two, f zero minus f one. So the doubling formulas are giving us what we should get, okay? So we know where to start. You know the the one length time series is its own Fourier one length Fourier transform. Here you know we get something we understand for the two length Fourier transform, okay? And now here is a here is a four length transform, okay. So you know working through all the all the doubling formulas, um, you have uh, uh, you know here's a uh, here's an even part, here's an even part, and uh, they both contribute to uh, to this two length transform, and here's an odd part, here's an odd part, they both contribute to this two length transform. And then it all contributes to this four-length transform. Okay. Um, now, now uh, uh, there's a uh, uh, a subtle enhancement which we still use because, especially if we got that month-long time series, which is two gigs, uh, it is a little painful to have to, um, you know, in a single processor anyway. It's a little painful to, to have to um, <clears throat> um, uh, to make another copy, right? And every time, notice here, every every column of dots, right? These are little memory mailboxes, right? So this these are locations in memory, and and here is you know uh, here's another copy of that four length series. You know, in the middle of transforming it, here's our final copy, the fully transformed full-length series. Each one is a four-element uh, piece of memory in the computer. And if if instead of uh, just four, there's there's two billion, uh, it does get kind of painful to make three copies, right? Or two, you know, we got the original and two copies. It would be much more efficient, and it's, and and this used to be. Uh, much, uh, much more true as well. Much more efficient. If 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 all we could do is switch the order of these two here, then um, uh, then you notice that that we can keep accumulating into the same memory spots, and so you know we don't need extra copies. We can keep the same memory, and the same memory is being used here. The same memory is being used here. Where we get these crossy, you know, crossed wires here, totally crossed wires, um, that's where we can't we can't just uh, we can't keep accumulating. We got to make another copy. All right. So what if we uh, uh, what if we straighten it out? Okay. Um, so the straight threads retain values in place, and we don't need extra copies. We don't need uh, what we used to call buffer storage. Actually, in my code, you'll still see that that buffer storage term. So uh, uh, let's look at the binary address, right? This is at address zero, index one, two, three. Okay, and what we want to do is switch two and uh, we want to switch one and two 
index one and two, okay, and and make these uh, these threads straight, okay. So the uh, uh, okay, so zero in binary is is uh, you know we got four, so so in binary we need two 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 binary digits zero zero, two is uh, is one zero, one is zero one right, and three is one one. So if we if we reverse the order of all the addresses, zero zero stays zero zero, which is zero location zero. One zero becomes zero one, which is location one. Zero one becomes one zero, which is location two, and one one stays one one, which is three. Okay. So all you have to do is, and this actually applies no matter you know even if you have two billion. Uh, of these, which is uh, what two billion is ten to the about ten to the uh, um, ten to the thirty two, ten to the power no, two billion is two to the power of thirty two, okay, roughly, um, and uh, 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 you just flip around the whole binary address, the order of the binary address. And you get it. You get, as it turns out, exactly what you need to straighten out these uh, these threads. Even even if you've got two, you know, you got enough stages that you got two billion, right? You, for two billion, you need you would need thirty two stages, right? Because two to the thirty second power is two is about two billion. Okay. So here's an eight length transform, right? And our addresses go, you know, from zero to seven. So we need three binary digits, and this just illustrates that you uh, how you flip it around. Okay, F zero, and and the next one is is actually the fourth uh, component. The fourth, yeah, the fourth component. F two, F six, F one, F five, F three, F seven, and you know we could go to a sixteen length transform. We'd find the same thing. Okay. Um, this this eight length transform gives you a clue about about um, some things that are very hard with this fast Fourier transform. Notice that that uh, to calculate f at seven, big F at seven, we got to reach all the way back here. Actually, all the way back here. These threads, you know, there are thread there are threads that go straight through, which is good. That means we can do it in place on one. You know, one piece of memory, but we also got to reach all the way back. Okay, at every stage we're reaching, uh, we're reaching, you know, like halfway, more than halfway uh, across the array. So uh, 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 these 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 long transfers here make the uh, the fast Fourier transform um, very difficult to parallelize. Um, so, so for instance, um, when um, um, when Bill Savrin um, last year did his uh, senior project on uh, um, on the uh, uh, on, on getting fast Fourier transforms to run on um, uh, GPU hardware, uh, the great thing about GPUs, you know, like the NVIDIA card I've got in here, or even the you know, there's probably some some cheap. Graphics card in in the computer in the podium here. Uh, the great thing about GPUs is that you have 64, 128, 256 actual core processors. Okay, uh, I think the Pentium in here has uh, four or eight cores, you know, stacked up on top of each other, um, and and. Uh, you know, some things uh, multiple cores can run very easily, and other things are very hard to run on multiple cores. And and when you get to massively parallel cores, like you find in a in a GPU, uh, a graphical processing unit, these long transfers. This means let's say let's say one core was handling you know two um, uh, two samples. Okay, so we're fine up through the second step here. And then, uh oh, you know, we got to go talk to the next core over. You know, back here we got to, you know, we got to talk uh, four cores down. Okay, 
Uh, and these long transfers take time. So uh, uh, the fast Fourier transform does not enjoy a, uh, hardly any speed up on a GPU. Uh, now, the, uh, the people at NVIDIA uh, took that on as a challenge, and they figured it out. They, they, they have a method of, of doing these long transfer transfers, uh, and they kind of reorganized the fast Fourier transform to make it work um, on a massively parallel uh, GPU board. Um, and so, uh, you know, Saverin, you know, he simply adapted their... Um, you know their their method for uh, uh, for geophysical use on the on the uh, Linux uh, box that's down there in uh, in three twenty. So that's a that's a resource available to all of you if you uh, uh, if you wanted to, and that would be that would be the practical way of Fourier transforming the uh, the one month long um, uh, seismogram is in that GPU box. Um, you know, so the two billion element uh, uh, time series should uh, uh, shouldn't take more than a few minutes on that GPU box with the NVIDIA uh, fast Fourier transform that they, you know, they cracked their heads together and, and really uh, figured out how to do it. But it took it took forty years to figure out how to do it. <laughs> you know, they had to have that challenge of of. You know, having having these hundred dollar boards, GPU boards sitting there, uh, you know, with with two hundred fifty six processors on them, and saying, why can't we do a Fourier transfer? This is this is insane. You know, we have this we have better hardware than we ever thought we'd have, and it's cheaper, and we can't do a Fourier transform on it. Okay, so they they actually did it. They figured it out. You know, they, 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 and I, I actually don't know. I'd have to go and read their documentation, but uh, uh, they, uh, you know, they altered the butterfly here, and I'm sure they used very similar addressing tricks. Um, uh, but as I said, uh, while it was so hard to parallelize, uh, you know, even, um, even 45 years ago, it was very easily vectorized. In other words, they could, they could build a, a chip. A butterfly chip, they called it, that had these these transfers in there, and instead of, you know, it actually had wires, okay, that would go from place to place. They built it, implemented it, um, and uh, and that's how that's how Fourier transfer transforms were done by the uh, uh, by industry and and by uh, government uh, labs for uh, uh, for 30, 30 or forty years. Um, Okay, now how much time have we saved? Okay, remember uh, uh, each each step. You know, we start with an end length uh, an end length transform. You know, we go from one stage to the next, and uh, uh, we I mean we start with an end length time series. We go from one stage to the next, and and it takes um, it takes basically n. Um, uh, and operations. Okay, so uh, uh, you know to do eight, it takes uh, uh, one, two, three uh, times n operations. To do four, right? It took uh, it took one, two times n operations. All right. So so you take your uh, uh, you know and and the log to the base two of eight is three. Right, so you take your uh, uh, you take your uh, um, uh, you take your number of time samples, you take its uh, log of the base two, and you multiply that by n. All right, so uh, and that's the number of multiplications it'll take. Okay. Um, and uh, okay, how much? How much? How much less than, than n squared is that? Okay, best best to illustrate. All right, and most of our seismic data have uh, eh, not anymore. We're we're getting up towards uh, two hundred four eight being the typical seismogram length in, in exploration. But I mean for us, um, um, 
But uh, uh, 1024 has for a long time been a pretty common, uh, you know, it's one second at uh, one millisecond uh, sampling. Okay. Uh, so that's a pretty common uh, uh, length, trace length for our exploration, uh, at least our shallow exploration data. Um, the fast Fourier transform, okay, the, the log of the base 2 of 1024 is 10. And then we have 1024 times that. So it's about 10,000 multiplications. Okay? The DFT, right, n squared, 1024 squared, is just over a million operations. So the FFT is 100 times faster. Okay. Um, 2 billion, I said that was uh, 2 to the 32nd power. So, um, so we got uh, uh, 2 billion times uh, 32. Okay, 64 billion operations instead of, of um, uh, n squared. Is um, is a billion times a billion, okay? So the you know the bigger your your data set, the huger the savings. It's an incredible savings, just incredible. All right. Um, notice that that we can't have a half or a third of a of a butterfly step, right? We got to have a whole a whole step. So this is and and and. When I uh, when I tried to implement, um, I, I did a computer project in, in uh, undergrad where I where I wrote a, a, a really silly little GUI to to go around the Cooley Tucky fast Fourier transform, which I just took, you know, I took their Fortran verbatim out of out of their publication, and uh, and it didn't work, and I could not figure it out, and then I figured out, oh, um, you know. I, I, I didn't read the, the I didn't read their paper thoroughly enough, and it said that the number of um, you know n, the number of samples in the time series has got to be a power of two. Okay, and that's why it didn't work. So uh, um, uh, and, and you can see why you know by considering these butterfly diagrams. Okay. Um, so. Uh, 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 you know, our, our, our data sets are almost never a power of two, okay? Um, and, uh, uh, and what do you do, okay? Well, you have to, um, you have to, you have to uh, make your data set have, um, uh, have a, a power of two um, samples, okay? Um, so you're not... You know, and, and how do you do that? Well, you you just pad it with zeros. You know, you have uh, uh, maybe uh, eight hundred actual time samples where you have data. You got to pad it out to ten twenty four samples. Just put zeros in that in that last that last uh, two hundred and twenty four. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, you're not adding any data. You're not adding any information. Um, and it's uh, uh, it's going to lead to a somewhat smoother um, for a uh, uh, Fourier transform that you thought it should be, maybe a smoother spectrum than you thought it should be. Um, that's uh, I think there may be an exercise or an explanation in there somewhere, uh, or maybe I don't even get to it till seven fifty seven uh, that class. Um, you know what what is what does zero padding actually do? You know. Uh, but it certainly doesn't add any information, so that's that's okay. We're not, you know, we're not doing any great violence, and uh, and that's all we do. We uh, uh, we take our our data set as um, uh, you know whatever length it is, and before we shove it into the Fourier transform uh, um, uh, algorithm, we uh, we just have to pad it with zeros, you know, null data out to a uh, um, out to its power of two. The next power of two up, you know. So if my if my um, if my seismogram has uh, five hundred and thirteen um, uh, time samples, I got to pad it with zeros all the way out to ten twenty four, and it's not a big deal. Um, you, you just have to recognize what the 
what the kind of artifact of that is, and it's not a bad one. Uh, OK. Um, let me tell you a little bit about, about how this comes out. Okay. Uh, notice, notice that you know, with all these butterflies and everything and, and these doubling formulas, that there's no the, the fast Fourier transform is not is not fast because it's an approximation. You know, every calculation that has to be made uh, is made here. Every um, um, uh, it's just it's just a reordering of the calculation. That's all it is. Okay, so so the FFT is not an approximation. It's perfect. So so from now I'm going to talk about the output of the fast Fourier transform as if it was mathematically the same. I'm, I'm really just going to talk about the DFT. Okay, I, I, I'm you know we're going to use the FFT and now you know exactly how it works and why it's so much better. Okay, so much faster. But in terms of, of proving things mathematically, because the, the output of the FFT uh, is mathematically identical to the output of the DFT, now anything that I, that I can prove works for the DFT, it's automatically going to work for the FFT. Okay? So there is, a, there is an inductive step there, and I, I don't want to make sure we don't miss it. But, but uh, it's only an induct. It's only an inductive step, um, or is that a deductive step? <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, so, uh, um, so we're really we're really going to talk about the uh, just about the DFT now, and and it's going to be true exactly, precisely true also for the FFT output. Okay, so so. Uh, and as you can imagine, the, um, um, the we, we've explained the forward FFT. I've really derived the forward FFT. You know, with a few sign changes, there's also an inverse FFT. Really, it's just changing the sign on that uh, on that v factor, right? Here in the butterfly, there's v to the zero, v to the one. For for the inverse FFT, it would just be v to the minus one. That's all. No change. Okay. Um, and and what, are, what are these v's? Right, that's the only thing that's getting multiplied here. These v's turn out to be um, uh, sines and cosines. So actually, I have a I have a an FFT routine where uh, it doesn't, you know, the we we've hardwired the values of the sines and cosines in to whatever, you know, whatever. Uh, um, uh, whatever accuracy we want, so we don't even you know it's so fast it doesn't even have to calculate the sine and cosine, right? In a, in a computer, a sine and cosine is calculated using a, a, a Taylor series, and so it takes several clock cycles, okay? Um, and uh, uh, and and we can we can speed that up. We can avoid all those extra clock cycles just by just by using a table of pre-calculated sines and cosines. Very easy. Um, okay. <clears throat> okay. So, um, um, everything everything that's true of the uh, of the DFT will also be true of the FFT. So we're just going to go ahead and plow ahead and uh, and we're going to understand the output. You know what happens, and then we're going to use it. Okay. Uh, and and uh, here's the answer to those last two questions. Um, uh, I, I think in in lab one, um, you know, what do we what do we get out? And, and notice that I've 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 indicated down here. Here's here's my eight length transform in its memory mailboxes. Okay, so I'm trying to again I'm trying to visualize what's in the computer, what's in the arrays in the computer program. Okay. And then here they here they are. Here's all the the elements of the Fourier transform around the unit circle in the in the complex uh, Fourier transform plane. 
which you have also heard about heard of as the z plane. All right. So uh, uh, f zero is at zero frequency. Okay. And um, and we have uh, um, uh, we're going to increase f one is uh, 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 for an eight length transform. It's uh, it's uh, at a quarter of the Nyquist. Right, the Nyquist is over here at f four, right? It's at it's at pi, okay, and and you know you couldn't go you can go back to negative frequencies, and uh, uh, and and go to uh, minus pi, all right. But the way that we've laid all this out with these doubling formulas, uh, you know, so, sort of the way we're we're incrementing our frequencies. Uh, and where are we saying that? Uh, it's really, it's really in in here, you know, uh, in the definition of v. That's where that's where we're defining our frequencies, right? And um, and so what we're we're basically doing is even though we're just going n and not, you know, we're not talking about two n anymore. That was only while we were talking about doubling. Um, right, sorry, let me let me get uh, back to here. Um, we're we're going around the unit circle. We're going to pass the Nyquist, and and we're going to come back towards zero frequency. Okay, so this is this is pretty weird. Uh, um, you know, f f zero is at zero frequency. F one is at the the uh, frequency uh, uh, delta omega, which is the the um, uh, it's at the positive uh, frequency. Uh, sample interval, f two is at two delta omega, f three is at three delta omega, f four is at plus or minus four delta omega, which is actually the Nyquist. So the Nyquist is kind of in the middle of the of the output transform now. Okay, and then the next one is f five. That's at minus three delta omega. F six we're counting up now. Okay. So it's like we count up to the positive uh, uh, Nyquist, and then there's only one Nyquist, right? It's both positive and negative, and then we we're counting up from the from the most negative frequency back up towards zero. We don't repeat zero, okay? And and it just it just comes from going around the the unit circle this way, okay? Um. So. Uh, uh, um, the order is kind of weird. Uh, the positive frequencies, uh, it, you know, we're going around the uh, um, the uh, uh, the unit circle. Uh, not, you know, we're not starting at minus pi. We're starting at zero. Okay, the way we're doing the indices. And so, uh, you know, we got the positive frequencies in here, the Nyquist in the middle, and then the negative frequencies are are kind of increasing from the Nyquist, right? This is f three and f five. They're both pretty high frequencies, um, you know, because they're next to the Nyquist, and and so we kind of go up in frequency to the Nyquist, and then in the second half we go down in frequency. Weird, huh? Uh, so there's this weird symmetry to the output. And that's just something we have to get used to. Okay, so we're we're cycling around. We don't, you know, instead of putting Zero frequency in the middle. We put the Nyquist in the middle, which means we got this strange, um, strange flip from the positive frequencies and then counting down the negative frequencies. You know, back towards zero. Pretty weird. Um, but it's true of all of our all of, you know, all of our FFT uh, uh, outputs, um, and it's true of the it's true of all DFT outputs. So. Uh, uh, we just have to get used to it. Okay, better stop. So, I, I have a couple things I need to finish up about uh, the ordering of the output of the FFT and DFT uh, that are at the end of notes number four. Um, and I was able to give you the basics last time. So, you know, we're going to go. Our, our our Fourier transform is going to have evenly sampled. Uh, uh, frequency components around the unit circle. You know, one at every different frequency. So we're going to sample all frequencies, 
you know, from uh, we're going to sample negative frequencies, um, you know, from zero to minus pi, and we're going to sample positive frequencies from zero up to pi. Okay, with pi being the uh, Nyquist frequency uh, over here on the left. And uh, the the question is, you know, what order do we do that in? And the way it, you know, the way we've set up the DFT, the way we set up the FFT. Um, the first uh, sample in the vector that comes out is at zero frequency, and then we're going to come around counterclockwise. Okay, and we're going to go once around. So what that tells you is that we're going to start at zero frequency and we're going to go up to the Nyquist, and that's going to be exactly the same sample as the negative frequency Nyquist. Okay, negative pi frequency, and then uh, we're going to go up from there. We're going to start at the most negative frequency. And go up, uh, and not quite get to zero frequency. So um, it's going to be uh, uh, a little, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of the the opposite order as as maybe you would have expected. You might have expected that uh, um, you might find uh, like our continuous uh, Fourier transform was expressed as going from negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay. And so you might have expected to find zero frequency in the middle, you know, and then going down to the, uh, uh, you know, down to the left here, um, to the uh, most negative frequency, the negative Nyquist, and then going up to the positive Nyquist. Okay, but that's not that's not what we what we've done. Okay. So, um, uh, and it's easy to illustrate this. Um, with uh, you know when we've got just an eight-length Fourier transform where the indices go from zero to seven. Of course, <coughs> you know when we have a um, well, you know eight one nine six-length uh, transform, um, you just have to uh, you have to figure out where things are. You know, and you, if you're off by one, then you're off by you know delta omega in your in your frequency. If you're off by one one index, of course, an eight one nine two um, length uh, transform is going to have uh, uh, a very small delta omega, you know, purportedly a, a very uh, small, um, a very precise uh, frequency in, uh, interval. Uh, just a, a note here um, about the inverse uh, fast Fourier transform. You know, we can do an inverse Fourier transform at ft minus one, just using uh, uh, you know, e to the uh, minus i pi over n, uh, capital N times little n times j, um, and it's just you know, as you can see, reversing the uh, the sign. And so, uh, you know, we switch the definition of v from uh, uh, v to the power of n times j to v to the minus power of n times j, um, and we change. We also have to change uh, v to the power of k by to v to the power of minus k. Um, and and in Clairbout's book, uh, not the way I actually do it. Um, uh, it's only in the inverse FFT that he actually takes the uh, the scale factor. So you scale every um, Fourier component by uh, one over n, right? So that's just a, a real a real number. One over n is a real number that you apply to uh, you multiply by every uh, complex number in the in the in the in the in the output. Okay. And uh, it's uh, the inverse FFT, you know, just like the inverse um, uh, DFT, uh, really just like the uh, the inverse uh, theoretical Fourier transform for continuous functions itself. It's completely symmetric. Okay, it's a it's a totally perfect inverse. Um, now, uh, of course, uh, you know there are the there there are the things that are not represented. By discrete data, and if you um, um, if you have a uh, uh, a signal that's in the frequency domain, and you you alias it when you um, and you alias it when you uh, uh, when you sample it in frequency, and then you inverse FFT, you know you'll get you'll get a uh, time wraparound. Just like in, in uh, aliasing of uh, time data, you got frequency wraparound, and uh, you'll you'll see this uh, actually um, 
in uh, um, that's why there's a uh, um, uh, when when you actually use uh, uh, bandpass filters um, in uh, like in my software, um, if you don't uh, pad enough with zeros uh, before you uh, you Fourier transform in the first place, you can uh, you can get wraparound from uh, Positive frequency to negative frequency that will that will take things from negative time and put them in positive time. It can take things from the maximum time limits and put them at zero time. Uh, there there's all kinds of artifacts that uh, that you can get, um, and the zero padding itself can result in artifacts. So uh, uh, it's often a good idea to uh, uh, to give yourself you know even though you know you don't have any more information by zero padding. Zero padding is very effective in, in avoiding some of these uh, uh, wraparound uh, artifacts. OK, now there's a little bit on the 2D Fourier transform at the end here uh, of number four. And I'm going to skip over that. Uh, you can look at it. You'll get a preview of some of the things that, you'll, that we'll be uh, um, covering uh, a little bit later in the class. Um, a big issue for our seismic processing, our seismic data and migration, is this uh, implied uh, data transpose operation between uh, Fourier transforming in, in one direction and Fourier transforming in the other direction. Okay, So our Fourier transform always works on a, um, a, um, a one-dimensional vector. You know, our Fourier transform always works on one of these uh, you know, vectors, which is a, a row of, of these memory boxes, OK? And uh, so we have to compose a 2D Fourier transform out of a series of successive 1D Fourier transforms. And we have to do, you know, we have to do the Fourier transform first in, in say, the, you know, from time to frequency. And then we have to have a second pass, which goes from, say, x to, um, Spatial frequency, which here I'm labeling as uh, the wave number uh, k sub x. Okay, so that's k sub x times x there. Um, so this uh, uh, this means that we have to be able to pluck out those vectors, and I will uh, uh, talk about how uh, difficult that can be um, in the second half of the class. So I'll need to uh, skip that now.